hands down. By far. Time now for say what? The Spurs fell to the Warriors Saturday 113-92 in game one. Even a loss, head coach Greg Popovich seems to find some sense of enjoyment. Say what? Are you still finding some sense of enjoyment out of, out of this, even, even when you lose, even when things aren't going great? Are you, are you serious? This is, I mean, this is the easiest job anybody could have. I mean, compared to a lot of things, right? Yeah. I mean, I got flown out here on a private plane, you know, on a charter, not a private plane, but a charter. I didn't pay for it, it was free. It was big. They had food on there, it was free. I landed, they put me in a Four Seasons hotel. I didn't pay a penny for that. I went to a game, I had a front row seat, <laughs> and I got to watch an NBA playoff game. I didn't even pay for the tickets. <laughs> you know, for all the things you could say about Pop, he, he's very witty and he's smart and he's entertaining. He, listen, he has a good perspective on life in general. One of my, one of my favorite Pop moments ever was the year they lost in Game 7 of the Finals to the Heat. When they had this, they had the title one until Ray Allen's three, mm -hmm. right? And he was smiling and hugging Spolstra and LeBron because yes. he is so even keeled. Now, all the winning has led to that. Yeah, he, he didn't feel that way right after the game. No. Right after the game, he was like, enough of this. I'm tired of this. Oh, that was right after opening. the game. Yes. Oh, right after the game this weekend, he yes. was angry. He's like, oh, here's what I'm going to tell Danny yeah, Green to do. He had some hours to simmer off. <laughs> But that is, by the way, that is an amazing still shot of Pop during a basketball game. He, I think, is resigned to his fate this year. <laughs> that is the quintessential <laughs> I am resigned to my fate posture, stance, yeah, look, that, all of it. That's when your best player is in New York City. Right. You're in, you're in Oakland. <laughs> and you're not. Your best player is in New York City, and when you're asked about him, you're like, you're going to have to talk to his people. Yes. Like, Kawhi and I were on a group chat, right. and he doesn't really respond <laughs> much. <laughs> All right, time for stories to start your morning. Saturday night, the Pelicans won game one on the road against the Blazers. Anthony Davis led the way with 35 points and 14 boards for his first ever playoff win. Here's the part where we mention that Boogie Cousins is still not back. CeCe, how impressed were you with uh, Anthony Davis's performance? Anthony Davis, yes. I think we should start getting used to it. He's one of the best players in the world. But... Drew Holiday. I knew you were going to go there. Rondo. Like these guys, it's start time to start, start talking about the Alvin Gentry getting this team pre prepared to go into Portland, a tough place to play. Yes, it all starts with the brow and ends with the brow, but these other players and their support of him, that's the reason why they've been able to survive after the injury of Boogie Cousins. Drew Holiday, first team all defense. He's not going to win Defensive Player of the Year because guards don't win that award, but he's been the best perimeter, the best guard defensive player in the league this year and playoff Rondo welcome back into my life playoff Rondo but the story is the brow in this regard he up until this weekend was this isn't hyperbole he was the greatest player in NBA history to have never won a single playoff game so he now has that removed from him and you know who takes that mantle his teammate Boogie Cousins is the greatest player to never win a single playoff game but I'm happy for him and he was great all right moving on to the end of the Celtics Bucks game Terry Rozier and Chris Middleton traded three-pointers at the end of regulation. This one was a crazy one, less than a second to go, but the Celtics managed to pull out the win in overtime behind double-doubles from Jason Tatum and Al Horford. Nick, so many things here, I'm sure, but what stood out to you the most in the Celtics? Uh, aside from the wild finish, where I think the Celtics didn't think .5 was enough to get a shot off because they weren't guarding it, uh, this is, I don't know how the Celtics manufactured this many points. I was watching this game, aside from a 15-0 run at the end of the first quarter from Boston, I was like, they're just not going to be able to score enough points to win the game, and they found ways. This was, I mean, this is a testament they made to shots. their coach, and CeCe were numb to it because of Ben Simmons and Donovan Mitchell, but rookies having big playoff performances doesn't happen in this league. Jason Tatum was excellent. It was fourth. They made a lot of shots. I mean, they spread it around. You don't have Kyrie. We don't know what they're going to look like with Gordon Hayward, but these young players and Brad Stevens, the confidence for which they've been able to play with. It wasn't one player, man. It was Morris. It was Rozier and Tatum. I mean, and they made a lot of big shots. Like, you don't expect it. Young players to be able to do that, but Boston has relied on this young team that they have all season. Vindication for your guy Danny Ainge, who always refused to trade Terry Rozier, Jenna.
And meanwhile, mm. he's got himself a win. Yep. Mm -hmm. Staying in the East, the Cavs got blown out in game one, 98 to 80. LeBron's first game one loss in nearly six years. Victor Oladipo led the way for the Pacers, scored 32 points, including going six for nine from beyond the arc. See, how impressed were you with Victor Oladipo? A very impressed. I was impressed at how calm he was and just how efficient offensively. He got the shot that he wanted to shoot. He didn't force his three-point shot. He wanted to get into the lane, got into the lane. I mean, this is the type of performance I believe can boost his career. He had a tremendous season. If you look at the, the Paul George trade, come on, man, they didn't get enough. Oh, man, if he continues to play like this, people will forget about Paul George on the other side and wonder, man, Victor Olandipo, they have a star in Indiana. And also, he played basketball at Indiana. I think it's big for them to kind of have a hometown kind of talent there to be able to lead the pace. And I understand this wasn't his first playoff game because he was with the Thunder in the playoffs last yep. year. But this was his first playoff game as the man. Yeah. And you're going up against LeBron, and you're on the road. And to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and for that two and a half hours, be the best player out there, and to hit key shots when the Cavs were coming back, to spread it back to 13 points, hit the shot that essentially ended the game, made the Cavs remove their starters. He was outstanding. This is a guy that was considered a bust as the number two overall pick and has totally turned that narrative around. All right, finally, the Thunder beat the Jazz in game one, 116, 108. Paul George was the star for OKC, dropping 36 in his playoff debut for the Thunder. Nick, how dangerous are the Thunder when Paul George plays like this? Well, listen, I picked Utah to win this series in no small part because I didn't think you'd get a Paul George game like this. Paul George, if we remember, he was having the best three-point shooting season of his career. Then all of a sudden, something happened. He was shooting less than 25% for over a month. And he said something had gone wrong with his mechanics. Man, whatever was going wrong with his mechanics, he fixed it. At least for a day, he did. 8 of 11 from 3. I thought the Thunder could have tried to get him the record. I think Klay Thompson has it with 11 threes. He, he got his 8-3 early in the fourth quarter, I believe. They had time there. I... He was outstanding, and Russ played within himself. Russ had a couple bad possessions at the end of the game when Utah almost stole it from him. But Russ played within himself, and Paul George was a superstar in this basketball game. And, I mean, it overcame. Donovan Mitchell played well. His playoff debut, 27 points, 50% shooting. Like, this was an excellent, important win for OKC. It was nice to see the contributions because we said at the beginning of the season with two superstars being Paul George, and Russell, like they would be a dangerous team. This is kind of one of the few times that we've seen them operate together. Now, I disagree with you a little bit because Russ had 25 shots. That's still too many shots for your point guard, especially when Paul George was on fire. Like, they should have went to Paul George even more. Like, I mean, he went off on him in the first half. Like, I, I thought this was going to be a 40-point game. So, R Russ... Relatively speaking, he was under control, but 25 shots from your point guard when you got a guy who was on fire. It's so it, it's still too many shots. So moving forward, how do they utilize Paul George? How do they how do, do they run more sets for him? Then his overall confidence, it's got to be booming after what he did in game one because that Paul George we hadn't seen for a couple months. No, it was great. And it was the your point on Russ, I understand it. I They were... I mean, this was an 18-point game with less than four minutes left. Like, the Thunder had taken over, so I wasn't as bothered by Russ in the moment, in the flow of things, trying to get his shots up. But I understand what you're saying, which is there was especially a stretch in the game where it seemed like Paul George could not miss yes. and just feed him until he starts missing. He was, if you make eight three-pointers, you probably should take 16. You know what I mean? Like, he was 8 of 11. It, it, give him a chance to miss a few in a row. I understand your point mm -hmm. there. But that was a very important win. Because I think Utah might be the more ta not the more talented team, but the team that had played better throughout the year. Yes. Given their level of talent, given the fact that how good they were when, when Rudy Gobert came back, they were one of the best teams in the league. So that was an important win that I didn't think the Thunder were going to get. All right, let's move on to the Rockets. Taken on the Timberwolves last night. This one closer than Houston would have liked. They did pull it out behind a casual 44 out of James Harden. Chris Paul struggled boy scored only 14 points and making critical turnovers down the stretch Nick let's start with the positive though how impressive was James Harden's performance in game one made all those people that voted for him for MVP feel real good because James Harden this was a game that Trevor Reza couldn't hit a shot PJ Tucker couldn't hit a shot mm -hmm. Chris Paul forget the end of the game where he had the terrible turnover I know we'll get to that but Chris Paul was struggling Chris Paul's not always going to score a lot of points, but he never turns the ball over half a dozen times. Like, that's going on. Eric Gordon 
Only had a few shots out of 10 taken. But you, why did it not matter? Because James Harden, who's been one of the three best players in basketball over the last four years and was had the best season of anyone this year, James Harden was unguardable. I don't know how you guard that step back three. It seems like a bad shot. For almost anyone else in the league, it's a it's a force shot. It's a shot you're like, okay, we're glad we made him take that shot. And he makes it at such a high rate. He has a higher shooting percentage on the step back three than the spot up three, which seems impossible. There's, with his length, and all of a sudden, he's also in better shape, if you've noticed. Like, he's always been a thick guy, but he's a little more defined. He can play at big minutes like he always has, but play them at a high intensity level on both ends. Like, Harden was spectacular. That is what your MVP of the league is supposed to do in game one of the playoffs against a dangerous eight seed. Especially if the rest of your team isn't stepping up. Absolutely. Yes, and he shoots the ball better off the dribble. That's the reason for the percentage with, with the step back. And it's a, it's a, it is a lethal weapon that he's added. His dribbling skills are phenomenal. His, ball, his ability to be able to get past a defender and get to the hoop, you know, that is another reason why he's special. He's a lot like... Um, say Steph Curry off the dribble compared to Clay Thompson. Clay Thompson is a better stationary shooter. Catch and shoot. um, yes, so you see that with Harden. It, it was nice to see the best player in the NBA, like it to be rewarded because there's a lot of pressure in Houston. I know uh, the, the coach says, "Oh, it's not. It doesn't matter what we do in the postseason." Last night showed that it, it really does. And like this team needs experience together. So what I take from it is uh, a contested against a good team that was well prepared. They understood what they were trying to do. They didn't let Houston play at the pace that they wanted to. They knew the sets that they were running. So defensively, um, uh, Tibbs there in Minnesota, he had them prepared for this game. Now, they didn't make shot. It is a make shot, miss shot league, as we saw with Cleveland, Houston. But Houston's superstar stepped up to be able to save the day. That was one of the big differences between who Houston is right now and who Cleveland is. When you say make or miss shots, I mean non-Harden non Rockets were 5 of 25 from 3. Mm -hmm. That's a game they're supposed to lose when all those other guys play the way they did. Before we, before we move on to anything else on it, though, I do want to mention one name we haven't said. Your guy, CC, the guy who KD says has an easy job, Clint Capella. Yes. Clint Capella outplayed Carl Anthony Towns. I, like, Big yes. Cat is awesome. Mm -hmm. I love him as a player. Clint Capella ate his lunch yesterday, and Clint Capella was the only other Rocket other than Harden that you saw and were like, oh, he's he's playing an A-plus level game, and they needed every bit of it on the defensive end. And you don't expect to get 24 points from Clint Capella in any basketball game. It was critical because they weren't hitting their outside shots. The knock on the Rockets has been what? When they get to the playoffs, mm -hmm. they're going to fall apart. That's what is, is that mm -hmm. besides what happened with James Harden? Is that what happened last night to the rest of the team? Do you think does, does that play into it at all? Well, I just believe playoff experience playing together it helps. When you're when the ball's not going in, it's hard for me to draw some other conclusion as far as nerves or anything. Like these guys are great shooters. All right, they play offense at at, at a clip that we have never seen as far as far as their efficiency. This was just an off night. Their superstar stepped up. Capella stepped up because that's the reason why they're so dangerous. They have off shooting night. They can still beat you. What I told you, even though they play at a fast pace, I love the way they close out games now better than ever before. Chris Paul it used to be one, two punch with him and Harden. Harden took over that fourth quarter because he knew he didn't have that, 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 um, Chris Paul playing at his best there at the end. And listen, the, the, the knock is going to be the way they almost lost. That Chris Paul it, it inexplicably throws the ball away 70 feet up court when he's a great free throw shooter. All he has to do at the end of the game is hold on to the ball. Mm -hmm. I understand you might want to toss it up there at Gordon, but you only make that pass if you absolutely have to. Oh, and by the way, the Rockets had a couple timeouts. Like There was no reason to make that mistake. Here's what I think happens to Chris Paul to a degree, because we saw a similar but much, much worse, and it cost him game five against the Thunder, I believe, in 2014, the Western Conference semifinals, where Chris Paul in the backcourt, similar place on the court, they were trying to foul him. Mm -hmm. He tried to bait them into a three-point foul, and they ended up turning <laughs> the ball over and losing the game. I, Chris Paul and LeBron James are very, very close. They have a similarity about them in this regard. They're both such high IQ 
thoughtful basketball players that at times you feel like at the end of games they are overthinking things at the end of games they are trying to do a little too much instead of doing the obvious thing the fact that they won that game despite CP3 not playing well, the fact that they won that game despite CP3 making a huge mental error at the end, I think could be enormous for him moving forward. He's never been in a position, even with peak Blake, Chris, where he can play poorly in a playoff game against a good team, and one of his teammates can go do that and take care of him. He, he didn't play well, and he had a huge error at the end, and they still won the game. I, I wonder if that's a hurdle he's now gotten over. And I guess we'll see it as the playoffs move on. All right, let's take a break. Coming up, how are the Dallas Cowboys going to replace Dez's production on the field? That is next on First Things First.